All right, folks. Okay, can see folks filtering in now. Hi folks, thanks for bearing with us as we get started here this evening. I'm gonna just give it another 30 seconds or so for folks who are in the waiting room to filter in. Great turnout. Pascal, you really brought the crowds tonight. <laughs> I'm, I feel honored. Um, awesome. Okay. It looks like we've, um, if we're going by the, the popcorn method, it's slowed down a little bit with people filtering in. So I'll go ahead and get started. Hi, folks. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Emma Walker. I'm the ARI Curriculum Manager, and I'm really excited about tonight's continuing education webinar, really excited about the number of people we have, and also personally really interested in what Pascal Hagley from Simon Fraser University has to say. Um, he is going to talk to us a bit about some of the, the current social science research that's going on in that program and its implications for us avalanche educators. So um, for the time being, I'm um, as soon as we I pass it over to Pascal, I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute and turn off my video so my slow internet here in Anchorage isn't slowing us down, hopefully. And then um, I'm going to be monitoring the chat and the Q&A. So um, go ahead and, and drop questions that you might have there and I can help Pascal moderate those. Um, with that, I'm going to have us go ahead and get started since I have us running a few minutes behind. But Pascal, thank you so much for being here. We're really honored to have you and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much, Emma, for this uh, amazing introduction. And thanks to everybody for showing up. Uh, I'm really excited about getting this opportunity here to talk to you and to uh, introduce you a little bit uh, to my research program and the uh, research results that are hopefully providing some useful nuggets for you. Uh, before I get started with the actual presentation, I just want to acknowledge that SFU or Simon Fraser University is located in Vancouver on Burnaby Mountain on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, which includes the Tsleil-Waututh, the Coquitlam, the Squamish, and the Musqueam nations. Uh, what you see on the photo here is actually the welcome poll that we have on campus here, uh, which was carved by a local uh, First Nations artist, and that basically greets everybody that comes to us uh, on campus here. Now, as I said, uh, we're located in Vancouver on Burnaby Mountain, a relatively small mountain that occasionally gets snow every winter. Um, but um, But we're not really in the heart of the avalanche world here, but we're really trying to contribute to the avalanche world in a variety of different ways. And I think in comparison to other kind of avalanche, more traditional avalanche research programs, our focus is really on interdisciplinary research, um, where we're trying to basically bring knowledge from a variety of different fields and bring it to the avalanche community so that together with our partners, um, we can develop tools that really help to bring avalanche safety forward. Uh, we, we, this program got established in 2015, so we're still re a relatively young research program. And it was really a collaboration between the Canadian avalanche safety community and the university to get this new program established. At this, uh, right now, I basically supervise or work with a team of nine graduate students. Um, we have five PhD students right now, uh, four master's students, and then we also have a number of research associates from industry partners like Avalanche Canada um, and so on. And so together, we really have this interdisciplinary team. And people actually come from quite a wide variety of backgrounds to my program. So we have people with like psychology backgrounds or education backgrounds, but then also more from the natural sciences as we uh, you have in a normal avalanche safety research program. But it's really fun to have 
um, working with such a kind of enthusiastic group of people uh, that bring lots of interesting ideas uh, to my research program, and I could definitely not do it without them. The topics that we cover in our research program are also quite wide, and they basically span the whole spectrum from the natural sciences over to the social sciences. And at this point, we have kind of four main research themes that we're covering. Um, the first one is we're looking at kind of like how can we improve our ability to forecast avalanche hazard, uh, where we're primarily focusing on the use of snowpack models as an additional uh, source of information for avalanche forecasters. So we've been doing quite a bit of research there to better understand how these um, tools will be useful uh, for us. We're also working with uh, a variety of mechanized skiing operations to better understand how professional guides manage uh, the risk from avalanches. And there we're interested in better understanding or better capturing what type of terrain they find acceptable under what type of conditions. We've also done some studies where we we're trying to better quantify avalanche risk. Uh, so we looked at accidents and how the trend has been over time to better understand where we stand. And then last but not least, uh, we have a whole kind of group of projects uh, that focus on avalanche risk communication. So how can we um, create communication products that resonate better with the audience and that allow them to make better informed decisions. And this is really the, the research theme that's the main focus uh, of my presentation today. So my goal for this presentation today is basically to give you a general overview of our social science research projects around risk communication. And, and there will be some kind of results of studies that we've completed, uh, but I will also talk a little bit about uh, research projects that we have currently going on to give you sort of a, the bigger picture um, of what's going on in our research project. And I hope that, that there is some really good nuggets in there for you, either for kind of like, um, give you a sense of maybe aspects that would be useful to focus on as avalanche educators, uh, where we saw some challenges with uh, users. Uh, but I also hope that it will give you sort of a some ideas around how we could better collaborate in the future and um, and basically sort of work collaboratively on improving avalanche uh, education in general. Now, I've recently connected with Kelly Rice McNeil, uh, who uh, recently gave a presentation at Seesaw, where she really highlighted that kind of a, a public health framing could actually have some significant benefit for avalanche education and help us to make decisions about curriculum development and, and delivery in a more evidence-based fashion. And I really like her perspective on that. And we've actually had the pleasure that she came to my research group and presented there as well. Um, and we had some really interesting conversation afterwards. And so what I'm gonna do in this presentation now is kind of to use that public health framing to highlight where our research sits and how we're contributing to this bigger picture. And I think it really helps to sort of see, get a good overview of what we're trying to do, where some additional opportunities are and how we can hopefully in the long term sort of put this together into a bigger picture. So I'll use this kind of graphic on the right here to kind of highlight where our different research projects are situated. Now, to start, um, I wanted just to sort of highlight um, what our goal is of our research program. And it's really kind of like trying to provide the evidence and collect data 
so that we can make better decisions about how to support recreationalists in their avalanche risk management decisions. And the goal here is to allow everybody to basically make well-informed decisions that match with their personal context. So basically, depending on what experiences people want to have out in the back in the back country, we're trying to make sure that they can actually make informed decisions about what they get themselves into so that they're doing this with kind of fully aware of the, well, what they're getting themselves into. Now, oops. Now, I think it is well established in kind of the, the risk communication literature and the public health literature too, that kind of the first step here is really that you need to know your target audience. You need to have a good understanding of what their needs, wants, and existing practices are so that you can tailor your interventions or your programs really to them. And I think traditionally in our community, we don't necessarily have a good track record with that. Um, I think there's a lot of assumptions that we've made in the past, and and I think we've, um, and I have to say that for myself too, I often kind of assume people are just like me, and they have the same kind of interests and the same, um, the same motivations that I have. But I think we're getting uh, increasingly, or the backcountry community is getting increasingly diverse, and that assumption is just not really um, holding anymore. So one of our first studies actually was to simply interview folks about their practices around bulletin use or forecast use. And to focus on, 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 on forecast use was primarily because uh, we were working together with Avalanche Canada and they were interested in better understanding how their their products are used. And of course, trip planning is really the foundation of any avalanche risk management decisions in the backcountry. So we, we, and I use the royal we here, uh, this was the study of Anne Sinclair uh, with help of Henry Finn. Uh, they interviewed 48 uh, backcountry recreationalists, and we really tried to get a wide range of backcountry users in our sample so that we can get the full picture of what's actually going on here. And so we had these hour long interviews that were semi-structured. We had some general guidance of what we wanted to cover and we had a number of exercises uh, that people completed. Now, Ant's analysis revealed uh, this avalanche bulletin user typology which is basically a hierarchy of five distinct ways that uh, these interviewees used the bulletin. And I'm sure you've heard about this typology um, over the last couple of years and presented at a variety of different seesaws. And, and I know that she's quite involved in area as well. So um, I'm not going to go into the details, but the main point here is that it basically highlights that people use the bulletin at different levels of sophistication. And it really highlighted to us that each of these levels is a valid approach of using the bulletin, um, depending on your context, depending on what you want to experience, what type of terrain you go into is each of these methods or approaches is a valid approach. Um, it also highlighted to us that the, the different components of the bulletin should really be designed for the people who are going to rely on that particular product the most. And so I think it really highlighted to us that we need to use a more user-focused design approach uh, when we think about how to best create these products. Um, 
we also actually found an interesting connection with a taxonomy used in uh, the education literature that sort of highlights how people potentially move from one step to the next. And so that was kind of a, a nice find uh, because it allows us to think a little bit more clearly about how to try to promote the progression from these different levels. And I think that's really something that I, I like to bring to the avalanche community is to highlight these connections to other fields so that we don't have to um, reinvent the wheel all the time. We can actually benefit from research that other uh, fields have done already, and we can just apply it to our field. Now, we're actually currently doing a similar study uh, where we interview recreationalists about their in-field decision-making. And in that study, we're basically asking them, what kind of cues do you pay attention to? How do you combine these observations to come up with a decision to better understand what people actually do in the field? Um, I picture that there we will find similar differences in practices and approaches. And I think it will be quite informative for us um, to better understand what people actually do so that we can see what matches best with the needs they have. And it will help us to create products that resonate better with what they actually need. So that's currently going on. Uh, this is the research study of Rosie Langford. Uh, she's done a number of interviews, and we might do a couple more this winter to kind of complete the sample. One of the um, user groups that we're particularly interested here in Vancouver is actually snowshoers. Uh, we have uh, quite a large number of snowshoers, and I think that number is increasing as we speak, basically. Um, uh, there's lots of snowshoeing trails here on the North Shore Mountain, and we don't really have a good sense about their avalanche awareness uh, and what, how they use the existing products. Um, and this is an audience that we would like to uh, cater to a little bit better. And so with this research project, we're gonna to try to create the foundation for that, kind of a basic needs assessment of what are they doing? What are their challenges? And what do they think could actually help them better? Now, another research study that we currently have going on is around trying to define some user archetypes. Uh, traditionally, we've primarily classified our audience with respect to some very basic socio-demographics around age, gender. We often look at years of experience, uh, whether they have avalanche awareness training or not, and whether they might have been involved in an avalanche accident in the past. And this is how we basically uh, characterized our audience in the past. Now, I think one of the, the key aspects that are actually missing in our characterization is a better understanding of why people actually go out into the backcountry in the first place. What kind of experiences do they want to have? How motivated are they to learn more about avalanches? Or are they primarily just interested in spending some time with friends um, far away from many avalanches um, and they don't want to push the envelope at all? So in a recent study that uh, we did with the, some of European avalanche warning services, we included some motivation questions into the survey to try to better understand what these motivations are and what people are after. And we hope that we can, together with these other characteristics that we've used in the past, we can actually come up with kind of descriptions of typical users. 
And what I've put on this slide here is simply an, an example of what we're picturing. So I hope that based on this research um, or this survey, we can come up with these descriptions that would tell us a little bit about what these people are and give us a better sense of who we're talking to. So you can see here the example of like top left, the middle-aged snowshore does this about two to three day trips every winter, primarily during the holiday season. So they don't do this every all winter long. And they're simply interested in hiking around the tree lines, trying to stay away from avalanche risk as much as possible. On the other side, on the top right, you would have a young, really keen skier. Really, that's kind of like, it's a way of living is to go into the backcountry. They do this every weekend and if possible, they do have more. And they have an intro course and they're really keen to learn more. And so I think you can probably picture that these two different personas would have very different needs in their avalanche awareness skills and products. And we hope that with this research, we can identify these different personas a little bit more and therefore give us a better sense of who we're actually talking to. Now, all of this together, I hope will allow us or will give us a little bit of a foundation so that we can develop our products with a more user-centered approach, where instead of kind of having a number of avalanche experts in one room making decisions um, around what products would be best for users, we can have a little bit more the voice of the user in there and better understand what exactly are their needs and how can we address them the best possible way. Like I personally feel that um, one of the purposes of my research program is almost to give the recreational community a voice and represent them in a way that, that allows the avalanche community to better understand them. Now, another, the second step here would be to have a better understanding of where the existing challenges actually are so that we can design products that specifically target some of these challenges. And one aspect that we're actually pursuing with Annalise's project, with this survey uh, that we're doing in Europe, is to see how these how these um, user personas and the skills that they have based on training and experience, how does that actually match with the, the terrain that they typically go into? And so trying to see whether we have a meaningful match there or whether certain people maybe unknowingly go into more challenging terrain that they're that they have the skills to manage. But that's something that we're currently looking at and, and we haven't really looked at this, this data in detail yet. A research study that we um, designed after Anne sort of identified her uh, bulletin user typology was to look at bulletin literacy in a little bit more detail. The idea was basically to look at if somebody tells us that they use the bulletin in a certain level of sophistication, do they actually have the knowledge and skill to do that in a meaningful way? And so for this study, we kind of borrowed ideas from education to structure our survey in a way that we can actually look at the different levels of knowledge in a meaningful way. And so we had questions that simply looked at recall. We had questions that looked at kind of how well they comprehend certain concepts in the avalanche bulletin. And then we also looked at, are they actually able to 
combine all these different pieces of information into a meaningful assessment. And one of the main results from that research was that people were actually quite good at recalling information and describing these concepts in, in theory, but the application piece remains a fairly significant challenge. So people actually, the biggest challenge or where we had the biggest errors was when we forced people in hypothetical decision situations to combine pieces of information to come up with an assessment. Uh, very encouraging is that formal avalanche awareness education actually had a very positive impact. So people with more education were definitely performing better on these exercises. But there is still a significant space for improvement here. Another somewhat surprising uh, result that we had in this study was that backcountry experience by itself actually had no effect on people's uh, performance in these exercises. So it didn't really matter for how long people have been doing uh, backcountry trips. Uh, and we measured that with years, um, yeah, number of seasons in the backcountry. So over the, the years, we, we've done a number of these studies. And I just want to quickly show you kind of our latest uh, version of these exercises that we've been giving to people. And uh, please excuse that the, the slide here is in German, but we did this in Austria and Switzerland. Um, and um, I didn't have time to actually translate all the, the different slides, but you will get the picture here. So what we basically did is we presented people with an avalanche bulletin or a forecast where they had the danger ratings, they had an one or two avalanche problems, and then they had a short description of the conditions. And on the right-hand side, we gave them four different slopes on a hypothetical uh, landscape. And each of these slopes were at a specific elevation band that was either um, in the avalanche problem area or outside. And we also gave it a steepness. And so the task of the participants was basically to combine the danger rating with the steepness and based on that rank the seriousness of these different slopes from very low risk to highest risk. Now the answer that we were hoping for is based on the graphical reduction method, which is a decision aid that's fairly heavily promoted in Europe that basically gives users a graphical interface to assess uh, the seriousness of slopes based on uh, the danger rating and the incline. And so with that, you would actually come up with a solution to that task. Unfortunately, only about 16% of the participants actually provided this solution. Now we designed the experiment in a way that the patterns, the response patterns that we got from participants would actually give us an indication of how they approached a problem. And so we could tell that about 55% of the participants did this assessment in a sequential way where they first split the, um, the slopes up according to the danger level. And then within those groups, they split it up further according to the incline. And I think that's very interesting to know, to sort of see how people actually approach these kind of problems. Now, this sequential splitting up actually doesn't always result in the right solution. And so um, I think it's important for us to know that this is a potential weakness of people's uh, approach. Um, 
We also found out uh, that quite a significant number of people actually completely ignored the aspect information of the avalanche problem. So they only looked at the elevation dependence of the danger rating. And last but not least, we also saw that depending on the avalanche problem type, they also used additional information uh, to assess the, um, the seriousness of these slopes. So for example, for wind slabs, they really put a lot stronger weight on elevation in general, or for wet slabs, they, they weighted aspect a little bit more and ignored other information. So I think this gives some, these types of exercises can give some useful insights around how recreationalists actually use the information that's provided in the bulletin. Um, and it might actually be different from what we generally assume of how they're supposed to use this information. And I hope that can give a good starting point for kind of the rethinking about how we provide uh, this information in the best possible way. Now, one aspect, one challenge of, of this exercise is that the incline values for these different slopes are provided with qualitative terms. And so we actually wanted to see whether people have a meaningful understanding of what these terms actually mean. And so we asked them to indicate at what number of degrees these different qualitative terms starts. And uh, what we found out is actually that there's a significant number of participants who didn't have an appropriate understanding of those terms. And so, for example, it was roughly half of the people who thought that extremely steep terrain started at steeper terrain than what it actually did. And so I think that's actually a, a significant problem if there is a miscommunication at that level. Um, at the bottom of the table, you see that about 17% of all participants have at least three errors when we ask them about these uh, uh, incline ranges. And interestingly enough, there was very little correlation with the number of errors that people made and their confidence in their assessment. So it'll be really interesting to see who are those people who made a lot of errors here, but are actually highly confident in their answers. Another um, question that we had in one of the earlier surveys was trying to get at how people understand the danger scale, the nature of the danger scale. What you see on the right is a graph that shows the exponential character of the avalanche danger scale. That basically means that the difference in the severity of the condition increases as we go up on the scale. So as this concave shape to the curve. And the reason for this exponential growth of the danger scale is that we have three things growing at the same time. We have the, the instability growing, so things get more unstable. Um, we have the number of locations where avalanches can get triggered increasing at the same time. And we have the size of avalanches increasing at the same time. And the combination of these three factors together basically result in this exponential scale. Now, we were curious whether recreationalists actually view the scale in that way. And so we came up with this question here that you can see where we had different sliders where people could sort of provide their perspective of where they think avalanche, the severity of the conditions are. And when we analyzed the data that we got out of this, we found several, seven distinct patterns. About half of our sample actually looked at the scale or at least their answers indicated 
that they look at the scale as a fairly linear scale where we have kind of equal intervals at every um, step. Another 13% looked at it as a fairly linear scale, but the range in considerable was wider. Another 20% looked at it more as a convex shape where the difference between the different levels actually decreases. And only 6% in the end had somewhat of a convex or a concave shape to the curve. Huh? So I think it's quite interesting to see that maybe recreationalists don't necessarily look at the scale the way that avalanche researchers have defined that scale. And I think if we have a miscommunication at that level, that has the potential to lead to, um, to errors in the assessment process and the decision-making that follows it. So I think our challenge here when we're trying to, to highlight challenges is to try to come up with meaningful approaches for really identifying where these challenges are. And I hope that some of our research with these exercises can help to pinpoint some where we have some potential challenges. And so I hope that over time, this can result into a comprehensive or at least systematic um, needs assessment where we can properly identify what are the existing challenges so that we can make informed choices about how to, to best approach them. Now, another line of research that we've been working on lately was to actually look at products and sort of trying to better understand how we could make them better and then actually evaluate what the best options are. And one of the first studies we did along those lines was to look at different representations of the aspect and elevation information uh, for avalanche problems. And so we had a similar um, exercise that I just showed you, um, a little bit more complicated. Um, and we presented participants with the avalanche problem information in a number of different ways. So some participants got the uh, Canadian format, which you can see at the very top here. Um, other participants got the American format where we have the combined aspect and elevation rows. And then we actually created a third option, which was the combined aspect elevation rows where we put all the the avalanche pro the two avalanche problems together into a simple graphic and we basically had participants do these exercises and then in the analysis we looked what's the influence of the the, the graphic display um, on people's performance so they did were they able to have less mistakes uh, were they able to do the exercise faster and so on and what we found was basically that design matters. And so the American um, graphic or people who had the American graphic actually performed the best, uh, significantly better uh, than the other participants. Um, and so I think we have a little work to do here up in Canada to uh, basically improve our presentation of the avalanche problem information. Within that um, survey that we conducted there, we were also curious to look at what kind of effect different learning interventions would have. And so we actually had participants um, complete this exercise multiple times. 
think four times in total. And in the middle of it, we actually gave people a learning intervention. They either had to personally reflect on the approach that they've taken uh, to solve this exercise. Um, another part of the sample got the answers. And then in the third sample, or in this, yeah, third sample, we actually provided participants with the answers and an explanation to it. And it is kind of like, as you would expect, um, people who got the answer performed significantly better in the subsequent exercises. Uh, and we actually got the best performance if we provided, when we provided the answers and explanations that, uh, for why we came up with these answers. And so I think what this study really highlighted, and it really comes out in kind of the general feedback that we got about this survey, was that people really liked these exercises. Uh, we had like close to 90% of participants um, really liked the exercises and would welcome exercises along these lines in some sort of an online format that would actually allow them to test their skills um, and to, to get feedback on how well they do. And our thinking is that the avalanche bulletins themselves could actually be a great opportunity for providing recreationalists with these types of exercises. And it could provide this just-in-time education opportunity. Unfortunately, recreationalists don't take an avalanche course every year where they could get provide get some feedback on how well their skills are, but they use the bulletin on a fairly regular basis. And so I think we, we should take advantage of these opportunities. And at the same time, these exercises could also provide the warning services with some insight about how well recreationalists actually do and do they actually uh, interpret the provided information the way it's intended to be interpreted. So I think there could be some really nice opportunities for a two-way communication. As part of this study, uh, we also looked a little bit about at the travel and terrain advice statement. I think in the US, uh, these statements are often called um, the bottom line, where the forecasters really try to summarize what are the key points to take away. And so we wanted to know how useful participants think these statements are, um, how, easy or difficult they find them to understand and how confident they are in their skills to actually recognize these conditions in the field. And so we had, I think about 16 statements from Avalanche Canada and we slightly modified them to sort of see whether, how much of an impact that reducing the jargon in these statements and complementing them with some additional explanations, how much of a difference that would actually make in the usefulness of these statements. And so the statement that you see here on the, on the slide is one about wind slabs. And so the original statement was, watch for areas of hard wind slab on alpine features. And in our treatment, we added this additional uh, sentence to it to give some help around how to actually recognize that condition. So we added uh, a good indicator is when traveling suddenly gets easier because you don't sink in as much. Now, our, our analysis showed that these simple modifications actually make the statements a lot more accessible for introductory level users without actually affecting their usefulness for more advanced users. So I think it really highlighted that 
there is opportunities for us to simplify things and with that actually help entry-level users um, to get into our community in a much easier way. And it wouldn't really take that much. So I hope we can uh, implement some of our um, insights that we gained from our study with Avalanche Canada in the future. So I hope that that this type of research will really help us to create the foundation for actually create evidence-based solution that we can make informed decisions about how to best improve our existing products and hopefully also kind of continuously monitor the impact of new initiatives that we have. Because I think it's really important for us to have a solid understanding if we develop something new, have a solid understanding of how much that actually impacts um, the performance of people that need to use this information. So I think <laughs> in the long term, I hope that this research program can really help us to kind of come up with a more community-based and social science supported approach for developing new bulletin products or developing new curriculum. But I think one of the challenges is really how can we better integrate that into the existing development cycle for these products? And as a social science researcher, I currently feel that these kind of studies are currently more afterthoughts. And community consultation is so far rather limited. And a good example of this right now is that Avalanche Canada recently changed their map of how they present um, Avalanche forecasts on the, on the landing page. And they've moved to dynamic forecast regions. So they got away with kind of the static forecast regions and they now have dynamic ones uh, that um, that re better reflect the conditions. Um, this was a development that took a couple of years because it, it takes quite a bit of kind of background development to actually be able to facilitate that. And they worked with um, the Colorado Avalanche Information Center for that. Um, but they were, launched it this winter, um, but with relatively little uh, user input. And I think it would be really nice if the user perspective would have been included in this development from the very beginning. Now, one challenge with getting the users included is that participants in our studies are often the keeners who are really dialed into avalanche awareness um, and are really keen to learn more. Um, and they don't necessarily kind of uh, represent the audience where there is the biggest challenges. So I hope that we could create a system for the future that would help us to do this better. And I want to quickly walk you through what my vision is here. Um, and maybe some of you would have some comments about this so that we can kind of like think about how to best do this in the future. So basically what I want to do is to create a better communication channel between the backcountry user community and Avalanche Warning Services. Now to do this, I'm picturing to create a community of interested recreationalists who would be interested in participating in these types of study on a more regular basis. And 
in order for us to have the full range of backcountry users in this research panel, we will continuously try to recruit them um, in a variety of different ways. Um, it's easy for us to recruit the keeners, as I explained before, but maybe we could come up with creative ideas to also recruit folks who are maybe more at the early stages of their backcountry careers or people who don't go out into the backcountry that many times per winter. But it would be really useful to have their perspective for the development of some of these products. Now, if we had a research panel like that of interested community members that are interested in helping us with this research and with the development of different products, we could then have relatively targeted and timely research studies that can better um, support development projects of avalanche warning services. So we will be able to respond to these needs in a quicker way because we would know that we can have that we can access this group of, of community members more quickly. I'm currently in the process of trying to set up a system like this. Um, I'm currently doing it with Avalanche Canada, and we're just starting a project with the Colorado Avalanche Information Center, where we're trying to do this as well. And then I have similar studies going on with two European avalanche warning services as well. Now, of course, avalanche awareness education is also a big part of this bigger picture. And I think in your case, you actually have the luxury that you have a community of past students that you should be able to access relatively easily. So it might be easier for you to actually recruit some of these people who would be interested in participating um, in these studies, which would allow you to sort of do long-term tracking of what their practices are, how they're using the skills that they've learned in your courses. And so I think that would be very insightful for improving uh, avalanche awareness products and, and courses in the future. Of course, some of these students might also then be fed into kind of this research panel um, on the left-hand side. But I, my desire is to basically create some sort of system along those lines that allows us to do this important social science research in a quicker way and in a targeted way that really allows us to support um, the development of new products. Another thing where I think we're currently struggling a, a little bit is that the social science projects, in my opinion, are not sufficiently coordinated yet. They're kind of like one-off studies here and there. And I think if we could actually come together as a community, and use those resources better, we would be able to kind of benefit from these studies at a much higher level and sort of better identify general patterns that can be generalized uh, across the population. And we could collaboratively fill in the holes to create this bigger picture. So I really hope that kind of in the future, we will be able to come up with a systematic approach to design avalanche safety product that's based on evidence, where we have a better understanding of the needs of the users and can explicitly test whether a new product or a new curriculum actually improves uh, the skills that we're hoping um, our students, our customers will get out of. 
last but not least, I just wanted to highlight here that one of my objectives uh, in my research program is also to create these connections to other fields. And I think I, I highlighted this in the um, in the introduction already. I really think we it would be good for us to kind of go out and, and try to find nuggets from other fields. Um, obvious ones here would be risk communication, education, public health. Um, and I'm really trying to sort of build these connections that we can um, we can um, benefit from them and apply it uh, in our field. Of course, this is really kind of like a community effort. And, and I really sort of think it needs a close collaboration between all the different stakeholders um, of the community which includes the community members themselves. And I think they, they need to be brought to the table a little bit more actively. And I hope that we can uh, provide a meaningful, we can help with that in a meaningful way. But I think really, I would like if we lo looked at avalanche awareness education in a more, um, from, from a systems perspective that really includes everybody, um, educators, the warning services, the research that can facilitate some of this um, finding of evidence and the community members themselves. So I have a few kind of like, what are my wishes for the future? So I, I really hope that we can develop a better understanding of our diverse backcountry community, what are their needs, their wants, their, their practices. Um, it would be good to have more community input so that we can use a more user-centered design approach for developing meaningful solutions that actually resonate um, with uh, the users. We need to better connect with other relevant fields. As I just said, I think we need more of a systems approach to our challenge. We need to continually monitor um, the impacts that we have. And I really feel that we should have that as a critical part of all of our developments is that we, we need to include that we monitor the impact in whatever way we do this, but that we at least have some sort of information about what the impact of a new product or initiative is. And then, as I mentioned before, I hope for this more permanent integration and better coordination in our social science support for the, for the Avalanche community. So these are kind of like my wishes for the future. And um, I hope that with my research program, I'm able to help the community to, to move in that direction. Now, I also wanna give you some kind of practical insights to maybe kind of the, the top four things that really popped out uh, to me um, from the research that we've done so far. Um, and I think one of them is, is definitely that kind of recreationalist perspective of the danger scale might not be as, um, might not be the same as um, the perspective from, from avalanche researchers. Um, so that linear perspective instead of the exponential perspective that has the potential to lead to some miscommunication. Um, Combining information into an assessment and a decision remains a challenge. And maybe this is something uh, where educators can put a stronger focus on, on that kind of like combining the information together. Um, and I think it's, it's really encouraging is maybe the wrong word, but, but I think we should be aware that students are looking for opportunities 
to practice their skills and to get feedback. And maybe we can think about creative way to provide that to them beyond what we can do in courses. And maybe the last point here is that I think based on our research, recreationalists do a lot of great things uh, out there. And maybe we need to just think a little bit more about the diversity of users out there. And maybe there's opportunities for us to, to fine tune some of our teachings and some of our products a little bit more to the specific needs uh, that different segments in our community have. And I, I generally have the, the opinion that our community is only, especially with the strong growth right now, it's only going to get more diverse. Um, and there's going to be a much a, a wider range of different uh, wants and desires in our community and abilities too. Um, given the time, I think I'm going to skip this slide. Um, that had some, some takeaways for, for Avalanche Warning Services. Uh, now, if you wanna stay connected with what we're doing, uh, we have a website at avalancheresearch.ca where we're trying to um, present, remain fairly up to date um, with what our research projects are. You can find all of our past projects on there. Uh, you can also follow us on Instagram, uh, I'm not the biggest social media person, but I have a very dedicated student who's helping me out here. So we're trying to uh, sort of showcase some of our research there. Uh, I also quickly want to thank all of our supporters of our research, uh, which includes kind of the, the base funders of my research program and also some of the other avalanche warning services that we've been working with over the last couple of years. And then, of course, I also want to thank all the survey participants. By now, it's been thousands. So we really appreciate their um, dedication and them taking the time to participate here. So if there is still time, I'm happy to take questions or just have a conversation about um, this research and how it could better support you um, in your work. So thanks everybody for um, coming out tonight. Thank you, Pascal. That was terrific. Um, I do have a couple of questions in the Q&A. If you don't mind, I'll ask you those. And then folks, feel free to drop more in the webinar chat and the Q&A. Um, Pascal, the first question is from Neil Satterfield. And it looks like going back to the slope evaluation exercise, which was a little while ago, um, that was one of the earlier things you talked about. Neil wants to know um, how many participants there were in that slope evaluation exercise. So we had roughly 2,500 participants in there. So it was a fairly decent sample yeah. uh, with quite a wide range of experiences and avalanche awareness education in there. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then let's see, there's another question from Juliana Garcia. Juliana, Juliana wants to know, um, she's interested in the perception, the danger scale perception. Um, and she's wondering if there's anywhere that we can learn more about it. Um, and yeah, like where we can, where folks can get more information about that. Um, we're currently in the process of publishing a, a paper about this. Um, and you can actually find a link to that paper on our website. Um, yeah, that's probably the best spot to find okay. more information about that study. Awesome, thank you. Oh, Juliana says, thanks. Um, let's see, thanks, Jason. Um, Dave Madara wants to know what methods are you using in your avalanche hazard modeling and GIS platform and whether it's based on high resolution DMs and what's different from the earlier models. A lot of questions packed in there, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're talking about the, I assume we're talking about the snowpack modeling that I mentioned at the very beginning. Huh? That is my assumption. Um, okay. Dave, I'll give you a second to, to let us know if that's not the case. 
Okay, yes, he says yes. Okay, so we, um, the way we run this mo these models is um, on a 2.5 kilometer grid across all of BC. Uh, that's the output of the high resolution weather forecast model in Canada. Uh, and so we simulate daily snow profiles at each of these points. Um, so that wouldn't include a high resolution DEM, like it basically captures the terrain at that 2.5 kilometer uh, resolution. Uh, we're currently, our main focus right now is coming up with methods to validate the quality of these simulations at the regional scale. So one of my PhD students is currently doing a study to look at are the weak layers that are discussed in the bulletin actually captured by these simulations um, at the regional scale. And a follow-up project will be, if they're not, then how can we get them in there? How can we correct the model simulations that they are closer to reality? So that's currently what we're focusing on, on that side of the research program. Um, Simon Horton, who is one of the main leads in that research program, just gave a presentation at the North Rockies SAW last weekend. I'm not sure whether they recorded those presentations. Um, but um, if they did, then you would that would be a good um, good presentation to check out. Awesome. Thank you. All right, let me dismiss that one. Okay, Jeff Unger wants to know, can you spend a moment on the takeaways for warning services and how that differs from takeaways for educators? <laughs> okay, I'll bring my slide back up. <laughs> Lots of good, we always get great questions from this group. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I expected that. Okay, so let me go back here. So here, here were my sort of high level takeaways for warning services. One was that I think there is there's simply a wide variety of users out there and kind of like the one avalanche product fits all situation, I think is just not necessarily all that meaningful. So I think we, we really have to think a little bit more about who are our users, who relies on what product and how can we, we design it in a way that better serves them. Like for example, the danger scale. So we'll be uh, using Anne's bulletin user typology. It will primarily be type B and C users who rely on the danger rating for their decision-making. And so my question is like, well, does the danger rating serve them the best possible way? Um, or can we potentially improve the danger ratings to make it easier for them. People who are more advanced can use other products uh, to get the information that they need. Um, another point is maybe that design matters, like, um, like our results from that kind of aspect elevation rose diagram. It's like with relatively small changes, uh, we can actually make products more accessible. And I think we should keep that in mind. And I also think that that we should really think hard about including these types of studies when we develop new products, that they're just an integral part of the development cycle so that we, we truly kind of make decisions based on evidence and based on feedback from users. Like I've, I think in the past, it's always well intended, but it's often just a group of avalanche forecasters or avalanche educators who sit together in a room and think like, we think this is best. Uh, and maybe we can, we can just do a better job at, at getting the community, the end user to the table as well. Um, 
So those are kind of like my main take high level takeaways for avalanche warning services. That's great, thank you. Um, okay, next question is from Daryl. Um, he says, it's my understanding that US avalanche centers have stopped using the danger rows that you showed for the US. I think Daryl is referring to, um, Daryl, feel free to drop this in the chat if I'm wrong, but um, I'm, my guess is that you're referring to, I know the Sierra avalanche center and a few others have stopped using it with the concern that applying the danger scale to the rows is like a potentially misleading use of the tool. Um, I don't know of any like broader movement, but I'm guessing that's what Daryl's referring to. So maybe you could speak a little bit to use of the danger rows. My understanding is it's still pretty widely used by Avalanche Canada, correct? Okay, so so I think we're we're talking about two slightly different things. So so one is kind of using that graphic for displaying the location where avalanche problems are, and the other one is actually coloring in with with the avalanche danger ratings. And so in Canada, we give out the danger ratings just for the three elevation bands, and I think most U.S. forecast centers do that as well. Um, and I think we're we're kind of aligning to that kind of best practices at this time. So I was primarily talking, our research was focusing on providing the location information for the problems. So we weren't coloring it in according to the danger ratings. Okay, that makes sense to me. Thank you for clarifying. Daryl, feel free to drop something in the chat if that does not answer your question. Um, okay, a couple more, Pascal. You still doing okay? In oh, yeah, yeah. Bring them on. <laughs> awesome. Okay, next one from Andy Paul. Um, for the reduced jargon plus added explanation piece you shared in the beginning, can you elaborate a little on some of the more quantitative findings? And did you find respondents reported any specific words or concepts that they assessed to be more jargony? Um, so we really just had, we basically presented each participant with three different statements and it was kind of a random, I think we had like, let's say we had 32 statements in total, uh, 16 that were the original ones and then 16 that had some sort of treatment. And it was us coming up with that treatment. Um, and, and we just presented participants and we asked them these three questions when they were relevant. It's like, how easy it is to understand? Um, how confident are you recognizing this uh, condition in the field? And then how useful do you find the statement in general? And so we did some, yeah, it was some fairly complicated linear regressions that we used to then analyze this. And, and the main point was that like the, the treated uh, statements, they really raised people's usefulness ratings at the lower end. And they didn't really change it at the upper end of with more advanced users. And so that was, that was really the main take home message from that study. Um, I'm currently planning a survey for the European warning services that actually is going to specifically look at these statements um, and try to dig a little bit deeper so that we can actually answer the question that you have, like kind of what specifically works with people and what doesn't. Um, but we haven't decide, designed that survey yet. So we're, we're in the process of doing that. But I, I'm really curious there because I think some of these statements that seem fairly intuitive to us are really not to the common, to the general public. More of some of the statements of like um, cautious terrain selection or so. What the hell does that mean? Like, yeah. not really all that that tangible guidance. No, exactly. And I think that's something that like this audience of educators is um, probably, we think about that at Aries sometimes, but those who are like boots on the ground teaching um, definitely have, have brought that to us. So glad to hear you say that. Um, Okay, one last question, it looks like, from Jason Denley. Jason's wondering if there are any apps that backcountry users can access with some tools to check for understanding, which might also assist in user studies. 
Um, I think Jason is, yeah, it sounds like um, I'm thinking of, I know some of the folks at MSU have had, like there's been some like in-app participation that was a while ago, I guess, but yeah, any. Yeah, yeah. Anything? So so our idea was that that maybe some of these these exercises could actually be integrated into the Avalanche Canada website. And so, that, so people could use it right there. Um, which were not there at this point. Uh, but Avalanche Canada has this website called Avi Savvy, which is kind of this online tutorial around Avalanche awareness uh, um, material. And they've included these exercises in there. So we were we were quite excited to to see that. And I will be happy to provide uh, folks with with the scenarios that we've used. And if you wanted to integrate them in your in your teachings, uh, or if you just want to play around with it, I'm I'm happy to share them with folks if you're interested. That would be awesome. Um, thank you, Pascal. I'll coordinate with you. And then for listeners, um, I will send that around when I share the recording of this webinar later this week. Um, yeah, it looks like, okay, we've gone through all the questions that have appeared in the Q&A. Um, anyone else? You have, a, you have a few seconds to get your last few questions in. Um, Pascal, anything else from you? Well, just a, a big thank you for having me. Um, I think it's always great to connect with the community. And uh, I think especially you folks who, as you said before, like boots on the ground, trying to teach people. Um, uh, it's, uh, I find it very important to have this connection with you um, because you, you see what's actually happening and then, then we can dream up of different research projects of maybe how to provide a little bit more insight here. Um, yeah, we're not going to come up with the magic ideas ourselves. Um, I think it's really working on this collaboratively that's going to help us move forward. So, so thanks for inviting me. Um, and uh, if there's any questions or if you suddenly have research ideas, uh, feel free to reach out and uh, we're always here to uh, to connect. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pascal. This was so awesome. We're really excited to have you. So thanks so much for taking the time and what a great overview. Um, folks, I am just going to quickly share. Um, let's see how do I make this full screen. Um, I'm just going to quickly share a QR code to, um, to a quick feedback form. I'm going to share this link again when I send things around um, later. But as you all know, when you ask students for feedback, um, if they don't do it right away, they're probably not going to do it. So here's my attempt at getting you to give us some feedback on this webinar series now before, well, we still have your attention. Um, otherwise, I'll leave this up until folks log off. But um, otherwise, you can look out for um, some info from me. Pascal, if it's okay, I'll copy you on that email so folks are able to contact you directly and share those resources you mentioned. Um, other than that, we've got a couple other webinars coming up, one in um, December and one in January. Um, since you're all here, I know you know how to get to the ARECE webpage so that you can find links to register for those. Um, thanks so much for taking the time. Really appreciate your um, everyone's continued commitment to your professional development. Um, and thanks for taking the time on a Monday night. Um, great. I'll stick around in case folks have um, questions, comments, or anything. But otherwise, um, I will talk to you all later this week. Thanks, Pascal. I really appreciate it. Thanks, and have a great start to the season. Oh, Juliana, thanks for letting me know. It sounds like that QR code is not working. Um, this is a this is my perennial Zoom problem. Hold on just a second, and I'm going to drop the link in the chat for those who have stuck around. Sorry about that. Here it is. Thank you.
All right, folks, I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar. Thank you so much again for attending. We really appreciate it. Um, I'll send around this link again later this week. Um, look out for an email, um, let's say by Wednesday. Thanks again. Bye.